Greetings, I'm Karen Colligan and welcome to the Let's Talk Leadership Podcast. So why do I care about leadership? As the founder of People Think, and in my tenure as a leader, as a consultant, and as a coach, I've certainly seen my share of very good leaders and my share of very bad leaders. And I thought, it'd be great to share the wisdom from the very good leaders. Hence, the Let's Talk Leadership Podcast. You're going to hear from a variety of leaders who are in a variety of roles, sharing their leadership expertise by answering the same six questions. Every single leader is unique in their style and approach, and we want to capture that uniqueness and provide you, the listener, with a diverse way of looking at leadership. So let's get moving and talk to our next leadership guest, In this episode, I am thrilled to be speaking to Jerry Gibson, who is the executive director at Systems That Work. We're going to hear all about Jerry's approach to leadership. So Jerry, welcome, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Karen. It's it's an honor. I I have a passion for leadership, and I love the work that you do. Um, You can sit and listen to so many different people and gain so much insight um into leadership and and as you stated in the introduction things that work really and things that don't work isn't that uh, (laughs) yeah yeah a lot of times it's trial and error for sure exactly so great great we're happy happy to have you can't wait to hear all about it so before we even get in to our conversation why don't you give us a little snapshot of who you are jerry and tell us a little bit about your role as the executive director at systems that work I live in Texas and, and educated here, a bachelor's degree from a small liberal arts school in East Texas, and a, a master's from Lamar University. And I, I did my doctorate in education from the University of Houston and spent uh, actually 27 years in um, public and private school education, initially in private schools, uh, in the last 24 in uh, public schools. I started out coaching, and that's really all I ever wanted to do was just coach because it allowed me to build relationships with students and hopefully make a difference in their lives. You know, I was asked a question one time at a little superintendent's meeting, I, my first year being a superintendent, they said, why did you go into education? And, you know, everybody in the room, we had been in it for a while. And, and you know, I heard people say, well, I did it for the money. I did. One guy actually said that um, I did it because of the history. I did it because and it gave me time to think of why did I actually go into education? And it was because I wanted to make a difference in, in students' lives. Yeah. And that, that never changed from being a, a high school principal to an executive director. And then, you know, the last 10 as a superintendent of a school district. And because I wanted to make a difference, I want to make a difference in the lives of the students. And as a superintendent, you can make a difference in the lives of adults. And so, um, you know, that's that's really why I do what I do and kind of drives me. I, I had a mentor who I had used him several times uh, it, it came up with systems that work. Um, he had been, come to my district, like I said, on five different times. And when I was an assistant superintendent or an executive director, actually, uh, that's where I met him. And he would go into school districts. He was a retired superintendent and he would. For example, I'm, I was having concerns in my business department. We, you know, we weren't having any embezzlement or anything, but things just weren't working right. Uh-huh. And he would come in and he would just basically interview everybody and 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 put together systems. You know, if something's not working in in that realm, it's it's either well, you have a problem with your your um, your employees have never been trained right effectively you know or maybe they can't do what you want them to do that's the second thing or the third one is maybe there's a problem with the leadership of the department and so he would come in and um just take the department apart and then at the end he would report back to the superintendent and say well i found this 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 and he said now i can just leave this with you or i can develop some systems Nice. That would if, if they would if they would take these approaches and put these systems in place, I think they would work more effectively. So he was getting up there in age and he asked me, uh, you know, he said, you know, who's going to be the next Richard Griffin? That's what I asked him. I said, somebody asked me that the other day. And he said, well, you are. Ah. And so I kind of got that idea to go into to, you know, my whole career has been 
um, when I was coaching, I would, uh, it was always a rebuilding job, a team that had, you know, not won many games the year before or for a couple of years. And when I went to be um, principal, it was a district that had been improvement required or, or academically unacceptable for two years. And we had to fix it and we had to put systems in place that would, and we got to be that we had the highest uh, um, academic rating when I left in the, in the, that the state uh, awards. And I went to my second superintendent's job, six campuses, six out of 11 that could be rated. We had 13 that were rated academically unacceptable. And the district was a half a point from being academically unacceptable. Wow. And we had to, we had to tear it down and we put systems in place. And three years later, we went from a, what would have been a D minus to a B and nice. then to a um, it, to no academically unacceptable campus for the for them. It's the first time in 12 years. And I was talking to somebody about that just two weeks ago. And they were talking about, well, you must have had these unbelievable, um, you know, plans. And I said, you know, we had what we thought would work. But the bottom line is it, we had to lead it. You had to lead it and hold people accountable and keep driving and keep pushing and so um, from that passion is where I got the idea of systems that work nice. and um, to, to work with, um, well, even sometimes outside of education, I, there's a, a company that I was aware of up in the Metroplex, which is Dallas Fort Worth. And they were having problems getting from their sales force to the, to the, uh, they were just, things weren't working. You know, they yeah. were, they were lost. They were bogged down. And, you know, I was like, well, let's, let's look at this. Let's tear this apart. Yeah. What can we do to make you run effectively and be, yeah. and so that's what I'm doing now with, um, with systems that work, trying to just, just make things better for the people that I come in contact with. Yeah. It's funny. So you say that you started this work and continued in this work because you wanted to make a difference. Then you find a mentor who's a retired superintendent. And what did he want to do? He wanted to make a difference. And so now what are you doing as the ED of systems that work? You're doing the same thing. You want to make a difference. So yeah, so this is going to be a great conversation. I'm looking forward to it, Jerry, and and really, you know, getting into, so you've been a leader and and we're going to get into obviously uh, the leadership conversation right away, um, because my first question right out of the bat is, how do you define leadership, Jerry? And we know that it's different from person to person. So let's hear about how you define leadership. Define leadership as um, basically investing in people. Oh. Um, I, I believe that when you invest in people and, and you never know what, how big of an investment you're going to have to make to get a return, but when yes. you continue to invest and you continue to invest and, and that comes in a lot of different ways, it comes from um, counseling, from modeling expected behavior or um, coaching them through difficult times. But when you invest in people that, when you need to come back and make a, a withdrawal for your investment, that you're able to do that. That's really what it is for me. I, I believe that you just, you, you invest in people. You keep, just keep investing in them. And, you know, sometimes you get a bad nickel. Um, you keep investing and, and that's not, you know, they're not interested in leadership. They're, they're interested in just really taking advantage. And, and that's really the hard part many times of, 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 of leadership for me when you finally have to recognize that and, and kind of cut them loose and say, you know, I've, I've given you everything that I have. I've tried, I've worked, I've, and it's just, you know, it's not working. And, and, um, you know, you kind of go your separate ways. I've, I've done that before. And amazingly enough, they would sometimes, not every time, sometimes they'll circle back and say, wow, I needed to grow. Yeah. I needed to grow. I'm sorry for how I behaved. I'm sorry for, you know, not wanting to give a return uh, on the investment. And so, you know, like I said, I, I've, I've thought about that a lot. Anytime I read, even when I was a superintendent, I didn't read a lot of books on education. Mm -hmm. I read books on leadership yeah. or on on actually on, on business plans, because that's a lot of leadership there. So, um, you know, I think the world changes, education changes, you know, social media, so many things change. But if we just can, I just believe I'm going to keep investing in people, whatever, yeah. whatever that means. And that's how I lead. And that's what I believe. Nice. And I think, the you know, as you talk about investing in people, Jerry, when there's someone who is not stepping up and you have provided him or her with the tools to be able to do that and they still continue to to, to not step up, it's your responsibility as a leader to invest in them 
and I'll say divest in them and give them a chance to find a place where they're going to maybe be able to truly excel. Maybe the position isn't the right one for them. maybe who they are and the position are not aligned. Maybe the values of w- w- how they operate in the organization. So I often look at letting someone find their space in the world is really helpful. And sometimes people don't have enough courage to do that on their own. It's never an easy thing. It's an awful thing 99.9% of the time. And almost always it's the right decision. No question. So, yeah. Right. So, I to, you know, people use the phrase, and I don't like this, but either you you coach them up or you coach them out. Um yeah. I don't like the coach them out part. I think part of coaching them up is, and you said it, you articulated it great. You know, they're just sometimes in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. And there's been some of those times where I've said, this is just not your niche. Have yeah. you thought about, you know, blank? And and if you really want to be a leader in that role, um, then you, you help them even as they're going. Yes. You know, Here's a here's another opportunity for you. Hey, here's a coaching model. Here is here is something. I uh, there's a, a coach. He was a college coach. I really respected, and um, he was really good at that. You know, he said, "I'm going to be here to help you get to the next level." And he had to sit down with him and say, "Look, what you've been doing here at this school is not going to get you to the next level." He wasn't cutting them loose, but then he said, "Now look, I want to show you change position. This one, you know, change positions, change sides of the ball, even." study work we're going to work with you and so you know he coached him up he didn't really coach him in some ways he coached him out because he coached him out of that position but he set him up for success down the road and i think we i i I still draw a lot of analogies from my coaching days and and you know the key to coaching is you you coach all week long so that when you get into the game that they are set up for success. They, we want them to be in a position where they can make plays. Uh, we want them to be in a position. But if you know, if we've done our job in coaching, the same thing is true in, in leadership. If we've coached people up, they're going to be successful. Right. They're going to be successful in either there with you or like we've been talking about, in another role, in another company or another organization. So, you know, we never stop leading. And um, I, I don't know. I don't think we ever stopped coaching. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yes. Great. So my second question is, I'm curious about the values as a leader. So what I truly believe is, is our values are our guiding light. I mean, they really help us make the decisions. They make the, help us make the, the good decisions or the easy decisions. And they help us make the hard decisions so we can sleep at night. Because if we base it on our values, then we know we're making the right decision that we believe is correct. So what are your top three values, uh, Jerry? And um, if you could define each one, that would be helpful for the audience. Yeah, it starts with me is is just integrity. I try to have as much integrity as I can in in everything that I do. And um, you know, I, I think integrity is just you're doing what is right even when no one is watching. That's what yes, you exactly. You know, you you're not going to cut corners just because no one. Oh, if if you will you will you try to do this if you think you'll never no one will ever find out. Will you cheat if you think you'll never get if you know you'll never get caught. And and that's just where that's where it starts with me is is um, striving daily to have integrity um, in in what I do and and um, I can't say enough about that one. Um, an, another value is just be consistent, mm. um, consistency that you be the same person, and of course different emotions come out in different situations, but if you can just be consistent and you can be fair in that, I used to, you know, people would come to me and they said, well, you said this, or you did this. I said, whoa, 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 let's get to the truth of it. Let's get to the right thing. I said, you can say what you want about, you know, Jerry Gibson. You can say, well, he's mean, he's hard. He's this, he's that. I said, but uh, I, you always want you to be able to say that I'm, I'm consistent and fair. And as long as we're doing that, we're being consistent. I'm not, you know, it's one thing to 
change philosophies that happens because circumstances change, you know, and, and society changes. But if we are consistent in what we do, then um, I, I just think you see fruits of the labor by being, yes. uh, um, you know, I, I had a mentor who's, who would always say, you know, there's, there's no substitute for documentation. And I really learned a lot from her in that. And I was like, wow, that's true. Because if you document, you can go back and say, no, you said this here, you know, you said, this. and it just keeps a pattern. And so um, I I certainly think that that's that's uh, being consistent, being consistent and fair, consistent slash fair. Yeah. And and I think as if if I worked for you or with you and I understood what one of your values was consistency and fairness, then I would know if you're saying, Karen, this isn't going to work. And this is why I'd be like, all right. And I'd push back some and push back some because I couldn't help myself. Um, However, at the end of the day, I would be respectful because, again, it goes back to consistency and fairness. That that's um, I I would know that about you. And that that's really important from people who report to you and who work with you. No question. So, okay, number I would always say people come and say, you know, hey, you're the boss. I don't and I don't I never like that term. You know, yeah. I think we're just we're part of a we want to be a part of a great team. And and you know, it just so happens that my title is a little different than yours. But um, you know, I like I like to use it. I work with you. You yes. know, we work together. The people didn't work for me, they worked with me. Um, yes. so I like that. Yeah. And besides the fact I'm from New Jersey and there's only one boss and it's Bruce Springsteen, just so you know, Joe. (laughs) (laughs) Just to be clear here to everybody, that's the only boss there is. (laughs) Okay, number three, what's your third value? And it kind of goes along with integrity, but honesty. I just uh, don't don't lie. Um, I I had an old saying, I still have it actually. You know, if you lie, you'll cheat. If you'll cheat, you'll steal. I've, I've just be honest, be honest with people. And sometimes, you know, there, there's no phrase, you know, be, I'm going to be painfully honest, you know, and I think you're setting, you're trying to set the stage. A lot of people, when they say, I'm, 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 I'm going to be painfully honest, they're saying, this is going to be hard for you to hear. You know, a lot of times, though, Karen, it's hard for us to say. I don't like saying things. It's going to hurt them when I say it, but it's got to be said, you know, so it's all, a lot of it there is in the, the delivery. Um, you know, being a superintendent was awkward because you always, uh, yeah. Depending on what state, and even you're going to have usually seven, but a lot of states have nine school board members. Well, mm. that means there's nine people or seven people that did my evaluation. Yeah. So you got you got seven people, you got seven bosses, you got nine bosses. And and one thing I always said was, guys, I, I'm not going to lie to you. If if something, I, I'm going to be honest, and I think that it's very important to um, to be honest, to be forthright. And when we make a mistake, we own our mistakes. Yes. Um, I I had a situation in the, the one the district I told about where it was just such a major turnaround. I just really believe that if a district makes a mistake, we own our mistakes, and we say, "But this is what we're doing to correct it." Correct. Because if, as an individual, you know, we we own our mistakes. But as in a meeting, and a school member said, "You're you're, you're talking too much." I was like, "Wait a minute." It's, I interpreted that is I'm breaking confidentiality, which I, my father had a job where confidentiality was, was everything. So I learned that from him, no, keep things confident. And I yeah. said, have I, have I said something that was said? And he goes, no, 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 no. But you're, you're telling people that, that we have problems in the district. And I looked <laughs> at him, and I said, I said, wait a minute, we've got six campuses that are IR. We do have problems. We're a half a point from the state taking us over we do have problems. And and I said, here's the difference. I said, I don't want y'all, I hadn't been there but a few months. And I said, I feel support in this room from you, Seth. I don't I didn't want to, I didn't want them to think I was taking a shot at them. And I said, I have so y'all have supported me, done everything I've asked and been behind me. I said, but I actually have more support in the business community than I have in this room. Mm. I said, but let me tell you why. In the short time that I've been here, I said, they'll come to me and say, hey, y'all got a problem with this. And I say, we do. But this is what we have in place. These are the steps we've taken to correct that problem. You, hey, man, we heard that. Yes, that is that happened. And that's true. And I said, you guys have, have let the business people think or told them 
we don't have problems, but they know that we do because you look at our failing schools. And I said, the fact that I've gone in there and I've been honest and forthright with them, but I've given them a solution to fix a problem. I said, they've respected that and yeah. they support that. And so um, there's so much that can be said that, you know, and they learn. The great thing is it, it actually, that actually, here that changed the mindset of that school board. We're not, we're, let's be honest, we got problems, but we're going to fix them. And this is what yeah. we're going to do. It, it was such a great opportunity and a, a great story of, of turnaround, but it all started with, we're going to be honest with ourselves. We're going to be honest with each other. We're going to be honest with the community. And um, that went and so And you're going to be consistent. And that goes oh, back to yep. that second value. But I, I, before we move on to the next question, will you repeat, because I, I wanted to write it down, if you lie you will cheat. What did you if say? If you lie, you'll cheat. And if you'll cheat, you'll steal. Oh, okay. You'll steal. Okay. That is now that is wisdom. Thank you. Woohoo. I love that. Well, actually, I don't like it at all, but it's perfect. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but it makes sense, right? It makes <laughs> such good sense. Okay. Question number three. What's the best advice you were ever given by a leader? And, you know, as we're talking, Jerry, it's obvious that you've had some mentors in your life and some very substantial mentors. But if you think about what was that thing that really, you know, just you held on to, um, is, is, there, is there something you could share with us? There is. You know, as like I said, I, did, I know you, you visit with a lot of different people from a lot of different roles. So, you know, my, my background and what I've done is, has been in education for, for so long. And I did have a, man, I was so blessed to have the most amazing mentor um, is a it, kind of a neat, but sad story. I guess she had never had any children. Mm -hmm. And um, while I worked for her, my mother passed away mm -hmm. and she not only was like a mentor, she's like a mother to me. In fact, I, I send her flowers for mother's day because it just feels that, emptiness and you know I, I always tell her I love her and everything but she would say something and, and it resonated she said two things one was I've already told you there's no substitute for documentation but that which is great advice for a leader document 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 but you know in education she said we're going to make decisions that are best for students mm. and so you stop and you start thinking about that. I said, well, of course we're in, we're in education. No, 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 no. You'd be surprised in education. How many times people make decisions that are best for the adults mm -hmm. or best for the superintendent or best for the principal or best for whomever. And, um, you know, if you, if you have that philosophy and you have the, the thought process, we're going to do, we're going to make decisions that are best for children. It should, it drives everything that you do really, because when you're working on your budget and, and it's always, if you always come back to that, what, what is best for the students? I'd been in this job that when I went to work for her, I was, I was a supervisor or as I, my title was executive director of secondary education. So I supervised all the secondary schools. And I think there was about uh, 12 or 13 of them. And I had some departments that I supervised. One of the high schools was, in transition. They principal was leaving, going to another district a little north of there, a couple hours north of there. And so I was visiting with the um he was the, the associate principal and he was telling me, he said, I really, I really want this job. I really want this job. And I was like, okay, well, I think you should apply. And I promise you, if you apply because you've been here for these years, you know, you've invested here, we'll we'll interview you. We'll see how you stack up. And um we were in this big conference room. And, you know, during the summers of a, of a school, especially a secondary school, they do um, what they call a master schedule. So they put, you know, there's eight periods in a day and you put all the teachers and you rank them by their department. And you just look, OK, this person can have first period, second period, third period, fourth period is their conference, fifth period, then a sixth period, then lunch and seventh and eighth. And, and, and it just it's a big board. And during the summer, you just you cover it up. And so I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it. It's pretty blank. And I, I thought I said, on your master schedule there, I see it's, there's not much up there. I said, but you've got these teachers. You, you said they're going to have conference here and these are going to have their, what is it? He goes, L, L, lunch, lunch. They're taking lunch. I said, so you've begun to make out your master schedule based on when adults want to have their conference together or when they want to have lunch together. Yeah. So they, they started the process to say, 
what does this adult want? Yes. Not what's best for the students. And so you know, is that was the best advice I ever got or the best, you know, make decisions that are best for students. And in education, if you just keep coming back to that, you know, if you're going to make it, if I'm going to make a mistake, if, if I was going to make a mistake and I had to make a decision, I would err on the side of the student. Yeah. If I'm going to make a mistake. It's going to be towards the students. Yeah. And so that's interesting. So we talked about how values drive our decisions. And then when you're very, very clear about what your purpose is in your role, which is the students. And so you take your values, you take your decision making function and you take the students, you put them together. It's easy peasy. And it's not. It's just understanding who the end result is going to be witnessing. And that's the students. And Hopefully, it's not about in, lunch. As a superintendent in three different districts, and the first two, uh, the first one was a, a great, great school board, and they did that. That was their mindset. We're going to do what's best for students, for our children. And the second one, I told you the story about, you know, you're talking to them, and, and but they transitioned from kind of being lost to doing what was best for children, a student-centered district. My third one was the one that was probably the hardest and I didn't enjoy it very much. My wife even said, you changed while you were there. They were that that board of the school board there was they were adult centered. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was they made decisions that were going to be best for the adults or the adults said this or the adults. I was like, well, look, I'm talking to the kids and the kids are saying this. This is what the children say. The students always spent time in the schools talking to the students because. You know, that's why we do what we do. At the end of the day, right? Don't you want to educate the students? Isn't that what you're supposed to be doing? Got to hear from the students. But it was, um, you know, I would hear the word, my constituents said this, my constituents said this. And I I would tell them, I said, you know, it's a very challenging thing because you are elected by people that are minimum age of 18 up until, you know, death. Can You know, they can vote. And I said, so you're voted into this office by adults but actually your constituents yes are the students yes they're not the ones who voted you in yeah they're the students and 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 if i had to look at someone in the eye and tell them something i i, I want to look in the i want to i want the the children looking back at me if i want to look at someone and say i did right by you yeah i want to do right by the students more than the voters yes yeah love that all righty. So our fourth uh, question is about transition, Jerry. And, and, you know, we're currently going through an enormous amount of transition in the world and uh, the world events alone uh, and, and the economic implications. I mean, we could go on and on uh, uh, about all the transitions. We don't need to do that. However, what I do uh, like to ask is, how do you lead through transition and change? Because it doesn't matter whether you're in a school district, whether you're in a corporation, whether you're in a nonprofit, it doesn't matter where you are. Transition and change is always going to occur. And you have to be able to recognize that and then lead through it. So do tell, um, how, how did you and how do you lead through transition and change? Two things at the forefront. And we've already talked about them, but we're going to get to elaborate on a little bit more as is I think you stay consistent. I think consistency is the key. My family, we 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 go to church. We went to church and I'm not trying to you know say anything um, religious or whatever. But, you know, there was a saying that I remember they, that people would say, you know, the method has changed, but the message has not. You know, it's still about a relationship with Jesus. Right. So, but that but the way we get to that point has changed through the years. And I think the same thing is true. And so the key for me in that is just be consistent. Don't get away from what the root is. And the root is still what we just talked about, what is best for children. And so I think through change, it was if you keep two things that there is, is be consistent and, and, um, you know, Look at what if, if if somebody's listening to this and they're not in education, well, you've got to have a mission, right? What is your mission statement? Mm-hmm. Be true to that mission statement. Um, be be true to that. And 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 because that's who you are. If that's on your webpage, 
if I'm Googling, you know, best way to do this and whatever it might be, fill in the blank, and I get all of these businesses and I've got to pick one, you know, are they true to their mission statement? Mm -hmm. Are they really being true to what they are? During COVID, you know, of course, that was for educators. That was, she. so, you know, we still had to provide an education. Now, the method changed, but providing that education did not change. So, you know, the world changed all, all of a sudden in, in March. And um, we didn't, we really didn't even come back to, you know, we didn't, we didn't come back to school. And, um, but we still had to, uh, you know, we still had to provide an education for those last three, four months of school. We got outside the box. We did Google meets. We did some zooms with kids. We did, unfortunately I'd say this, but you know, sometimes it was just, we drop packets of worksheets off and try to work the kids in. We, we were making it up as we go oh, as, yes. in, in education. Mm-hmm. Right. So then, you know, you're waiting, are we going to come back? Are we not going to come back? Mass, no mask, you know, all of these things. And, and you said it best and all that depended on a lot of people was your political alliance more than anything else. And I'm not, I'm not going to get into that, but um, we basically, the district I was at, we, we, we put a manual together and this is what we're going to do. We wanted to leave no stone unturned, but we, so we wanted to do two things. We wanted to be consistent in what we were saying. And we wanted it to be about students. In this particular situation, there was two things that were at the forefront, student safety mm-hmm. and their education. Yes. So how can we keep them as safe as we can and give them the very best education as we can, as, as we could give them? And I, we had, um, we were about 30 minutes from the local news stations where I was at and and one came or they called us and said, can we come interview you? Sure. What do you want? Opening school to go? No, we really want to talk to you about the processes of how you put together your reentry plan. Yeah. Because they said, we, we have gotten every single reentry plan of, in our viewing area. They said it was 90 something districts. They said, yours is the absolute best and the most consistent. But sure, come on. And so we talked. I just said, you know, it was uh, we wanted to be consistent in what we were doing. And we wanted to say our students are going to come first. It's about the students. If the adults have to be inconvenienced a little bit, then then that's OK. It was going to be about the students and two things, their safety mm-hmm. and their education. Mm-hmm. So. In our state, um, we a student. And a parent could make the decision, give you a, a quick little side story. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, you could either do your, you could do your learning online or you could come in and go face to face. If you made a decision, I want to do online learning. Then you had to stay in. The, once you entered it, you had to stay there until the grade change, which was for us every six weeks. So when, when every six weeks, you know, you start over with the, your grade change. Now, if you want to go back and then say, okay, I didn't like that homeschool thing. I'm going to go face to face. Then you could. So then came this question. Well, what about extracurriculars? What about extracurriculars? And I, I said, okay, we're going to be true to what we said. We're going to be consistent. So I caught a little, I got a little pushback on this one when I first said it. I said, if you are going to say, I'm going to learn from home. You can't come to band practice and you can't be in the band. I'm going to say, I'm going to learn from home. Then you can't come to football practice. Mm-hmm. That's people like, oh, well, what are you, what are you, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. If we're going to do nothing else. We're going to be consistent. Why are you staying home during the day? Or why is your child staying home and learning that way? Well, I don't want him catching anything. I respect that. I'm not going to tell you how to parent. I respect that. But if you are worried about it during the day, then you got to be worried about it in the afternoon when you're practicing football as well. Mm-hmm. So we just stayed consistent to what we were trying to do. And we said, we're going to do what's best for their health and best for their education. Nice. So I think through change, and that's the biggest, I just think that's, you stay true to that. Yeah. Stay true to being consistent and true to your mission statement, which is for us was making decisions that are best for the students. If, and Jerry, if your if your mission statement care if your mission statement says one thing, you got it plastered on the wall. Let's just say, yeah, or it's on your web page, but you're not practicing it from seven to five or eight to five or whatever your hours are. Then why do you even have that mission statement up? Yeah, exactly. 
And, and, you know, you said, you know, COVID and you guys were making it up as you went along. Who wasn't? We all were. And that's a beautiful example of what happens when, I don't want to say you embrace COVID, but you recognize it isn't going anywhere. And so we've got to update so that we can make sure that we are providing safety and education for our students. How the heck are we going to do it? It's the same thing that happened everywhere across America in every, I mean, in fast food restaurant. I mean, we could go on and on with every industry available. So yeah, that's why that question is so important about transition. And if we're not going to be open to transition and change, well, then, you know, obviously we're not going to grow and we could eventually go away. And that's what I think happened with a lot of organizations. They didn't update. They didn't recognize that this was something that they had to deal with. And so they're no longer with us. And, and that, that's not the book. uh how the mighty fall, uh, uh, you know, there's a book, good to great, which a lot of business leaders have, have read a lot of educators have read and it, you know, and it's a great book. It, it got a lot of great points in it, but there was a sequel to that, that a lot of people don't know about it. It's, it's, uh, why the, it's either why the mighty fall or how the mighty fall. Mm-hmm. And it basically talked about what you're saying. They, they had looked at how many fortune 500 companies that were the, let's say the top 50 of them that, from 10 years before are still in business today and over half of them had, had closed. And well, they, they want to know why. And the, the why was, why did it close is they, they didn't keep up with the change, the changing of the times, the changing of society, the changing of whatever it might be. No, this is how we found it. And this is what we're going to do. And they didn't get to do it very long because the mighty fell that way. Yes, indeed they did. Indeed they did. And we're still standing, Jerry. That's what we're I like. still standing. Yeah, that's my theme song. I'm still standing by Elton exactly. John. Mm-hmm. Okay, so number five, we know the best leaders are curious and always learning. So, what tools or resources? What do you do to make sure that you're continuing to grow? Well, you know, I, like I said, I, I don't. I stopped reading educational books a long time ago, <laughs> and I started reading, you know, leadership books. So. Um, you know, if I had two things that helped me the most, it would certainly be the internet because you can find anything on and, you know, and read, but it, it would also be the phone because, uh, you know, my mentors will still take my calls. Yes. Um, the, the ones that have, have been there for me and invested in me and, and um, I still talk to them, you know, I still ask them questions and, and, you know, how did you get through this? And I, I'm fortunate, I guess the two that I probably rely on the most who have been consistent and been there for me through good and through bad, um, you know, what they believed and how they became famous, became successful. I guess you can become successful. You get famous because of your success. You know, it, it, those things just never changed. They, they, they don't change. You make decisions are best for children. You do right by people. You build people up, you know, and um, just the things that I learned from them and, and this th- through the conversations I still remember them. I still uh, refer to them. I still go back to them. And it was, it was funny uh, in my office here, there's a picture of me and my, my, my mentor, Bonnie Kane. And she, uh, uh, there's a, we're at a, uh, we had a very successful soccer team and they advanced all the way to the state championship and yeah. um, state championship game. And they, they won it. And there's a picture of us. She gave it to me. She she waited until nobody was in her office. She goes, I can't do this. Let people know it because Yes, we have a unique special relationship, but it worked. Somebody say, oh, I bet you got primper. I said, no, 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 no. Let me tell you what. She would still kick my teeth down my throat. And the only difference was then she would hug me and say, go back to work. You know, (laughs) but she there was a picture of us. We're waving at the camera and we're at the right before the game started, I guess. And um, when I left her and I became the superintendent, you know, she had just impacted me so much in my educational career. You know, obviously I, I put that picture up. Yeah, And um, you know what? I, I had that picture up for eight or nine years before I actually turned it over. And she had taped to the back of it. I will always only be a phone call away. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So and she always has been. And so, you know what? She proved it. I didn't see that for seven years i didn't see what she taped to the back wow um, so 
Those are the kinds of things like in the very beginning, you know, the good leaders and the bad leaders. And we do remember some of the worst leaders and, and the characteristics, and we don't want to emulate that. However, when you you have a learning like that, that's completely outside the scope of what anybody would say leadership is, that's leadership. End of story, period. I don't like yeah, that's it. So yeah, beautiful. That is beautiful. It's funny you say you we you seen good leaders and bad leaders. I, I remember when I was uh younger, I I would look at before I even got married, I would watch people and I would say, Okay, that's a good parent and this is what they do, boom, 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 boom. Yes. And then I would watch parents yeah. that I would say, Oh, they're no, I don't want to do yeah. this. And then I got a dog and I tried it on a dog before I tried it on child. So Well, that um, is good to hear, Jerry. <laughs> I'm sure so, your children are thrilled with that as well. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No doubt. No doubt. All righty. And last, and of course, never least for me. So what piece of art or music or literature or whatever else keeps you balanced and brings you joy with joy being the operative word? Because we cannot do anything unless we're one whole person. So what brings you joy? You know, and I, I, um, I spent so much of my time, my life, just investing in people. Um, mm-hmm. the The greatest joy that I have is when um, people that I had mentored or helped or been there for, when they find success, mm-hmm. that brings me so so much joy. Remember, I was trying to actually a person. It wasn't really a work person. They were just having a hard time. And um, I just started trying to talk them through it. And she's and they were like, you you're helping. Me. OK. And they saw things different than me. They said, you're going to get me through this. I said, I am. OK. And, and when you do, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pay you. I was like, no, 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 no. I only want one thing from you. What is that? I said, just a hug and a thank you is fine. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. a hug and a thank you is fine. So in uh, the spring of last school year, um, I was I had taught a uh, a doctoral class at, uh, adjunct, and uh, you know I would still hear from a lot of my some of my students because I promised I said, look guys, here you know my cell phone number, you know my email address. Here's school, here's personal. I said if you ever need anything, mm. call me, reach out to me, let me know. I'm here to help. If you need a letter of reference, I will write it. If you need, you know, use me as a reference, just let me know that you've used me where I'm not surprised. And there was a, a couple of them that really took me up on it. And, and um, you know, they were stumped on their campus. Then they say, hey, what did you do with this? They would ask me as your district. We, we did this, this. But anyway, this young lady, I, I remember her well, because first time she walked in, I thought she was going to have a baby that night. And I was like, OK, we go around the room and we're talking and I'd ask them, I said, OK, what are you what's your name where I'm old school, you know, where do you work and what are your goals? What do you want to be when you grow up basically? And, and, um, you know, that's so interesting. And, but hers is different. I said, what is your name? When are you due? Where do you work? Because, (laughs) and she said, well, I'm, I'm going to be due here in about three weeks. And she said, can I talk to you after class? Sure. And, um, she said, I don't want to drop the course. I said, no, you're not going to drop the course. I'm not gonna let you drop the course. You know, you're very close to graduating, getting your doctorate. And I said, um, We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. And we didn't meet. We met every other week or, you know, we kind of a hybrid schedule. And um, she had a lady that was on the same campus as her and she would just hold up a computer and she would watch while we were having class. I didn't hold it against her, man. I'm proud. She's first time mother, you know. And so she was one that would reach out regularly and say, hey, how did you handle this or how? And um, I got an email from her probably in May. April or May, and in, in, I think it was, might have been later than that. And she said, I'm, you're the second person I'm telling. She said, I just told my husband, and now I'm telling you, I got my first principal's job. Aww. And she said, I'm Aww. telling you because Aww. of the impression you made on me in class oh, makes me and cry. the things that you did for us in class. And um, you, you, you impacted and we we all felt that way. We all felt that way. And you know that email. And it's funny that email was, came at a really bad day, on a really bad day for me. And it's exactly what I needed. And um, it, uh, I was going to my granddaughter's first volleyball game, and and I actually I called her. I said, "Okay, how's your how's your school started and everything?" And my wife was there. We had on speakerphone and everything else. And she just she said, 
you know, you took lessons and made them come alive to us. Uh, you, we, I, remember, I got here. I remember when you talked about federal money and how to spend our federal money and you make us do this exercise. And I thought it was so silly. She said, and I got <laughs> here and I had all this federal money, but I knew what to do because you had prepared me. And uh, she just went on and on and on. And I mean, I was just, I was kind of tearing up a little bit because okay. it just meant so much that I invested in her and she reached her goal and she had interviewed and she had to change district. She had interviewed in the district where she was at for a job. And she said, I thought it went great. She goes, I got passed over. She goes, I thought about just quitting. Mm. And she said, I took a day or two off because it hurt that bad. And she said, I got back to work and another district, a na neighboring district called and said, would you come interview for our principal's job? And she said, I got it on the spot almost. Wow. And I said, there's always, there's always a plan. Yeah. You know, we don't always understand it, but there's always a plan. But One hearing what her, and the, and another one opens, it's yeah, the truth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that that just that thrills me. It just gives me so much joy. I can, you know, I can sit here and say, well, you know, floating in the pool, listen to uh, country music helps. But, you know, but that and that's all that's always good and everything. But you got to get out one day and the, the speakers die. But when I've helped somebody, I've mentored them, I've been there for them, I've coached them, and then they are successful. There's that is that's it. I mean, it, yeah, that's why I exist. Yeah. So, listeners, I don't know if you noticed the difference in his tone when he was just telling that story, but Jerry, let me just say, uh, yeah, the whole different spirit of of the joy. You could feel it. You can feel it through the microphone. It's, it's yes, 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 yes. So listeners, let's start mentoring. Let's get out there. Let's help some people here. Wow. We were trying to, in my previous district, we were trying to pass a bond. It was, we're doing, we're trying to do it. And they said, we, you're not going to be able to do it. And we certainly weren't going to be able to do it for the amount of money that we were asking for. And we did, by the way, on the side note, we passed it largest in the history of the district. And I would get so frustrated in some of these meetings. I had to be there and the architects were trying to take these adults through this, but we had a table of students and they would always say, okay, Dr. Gibson, would you stand up and tell us if we add this to the bond package or we take this away, what will it, and I always said, well, if you put it in there, here's what's going to happen for students. And they said the same thing. They said, when you start talking about your students, they said, you just come alive. There's just such an energy. There's just such a, um, yeah. and, and, um, a good friend of mine was there. He, he worked me in a previous district and he had come down to help us do the, um, uh, uh, the marketing and stuff for this, uh, bond package. And he said, yeah, you hadn't changed a bit, boss. I've known said, why you call me <laughs> boss, David. And he said, you hadn't changed a bit. He said, you start talking about them kids. He said, or you go over there because they had their own little table. They were working through things and they wanted to, we wanted to hear what they thought. He said, you get around them and it's just, you're totally different. So um, I don't you, think that'll ever change. You you found, you found your niche. You found what you needed to yeah. do. No question about that. And so with all that, Jerry, I just want to thank you so much um, for your insights and thoughts about leadership, about all of it. And you know, there's nothing better than listening to someone who loves what they do. And and that's contagious and it's inspiring. It's a teaching moment for people who maybe don't have that much joy to kind of re reconnect with their center, to start to say, what is my mission and, and why am I here? And then how do I follow that mission? So I thank you. I thank you very much for, for, for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. And so for everyone else, thanks for listening. And I'm Karen Colligan, and you've been listening to Mr. Jerry Gibson, who is the Executive Director at Systems That Work. If this leadership podcast was of interest to you, go to our YouTube channel, People Think SF, and look at all the other distinguished leaders I've had the pleasure of interviewing. You're going to learn so much about the uniqueness of leadership. I know I have. And don't forget to share with your colleagues. Till the next episode of the Let's Talk Leadership podcast, have a good one. And don't forget to keep it real. Editing by Mary Lee Williams. Bye, everyone. Thank you.